Yeah. Ah. Hi. So, my name, as was just said, is Rob King, and this is, the title is actually, Regular Expressions Are Good, actually, and they are. And at the end of this talk, I hope you will agree. Um, so first, I want, to, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what brought me to this point. Um, just like Barbie's friend Ken, his job is beach. Um, my job is kind of like regex. It's very weird. For the past 20-ish years, I've written thousands of regular expressions. I've written regular expression engines. I've written tools that manipulate regular expressions. I, it's weird. It's, I, I actually do other things, like I can whistle, but um, it's, regular expressions are a huge, huge part of what I do. And I love them, and I want you to love them too, but not everybody loves them. And uh, the ineffable Jamie Zawinski uh, said, and I'll read this for those of you who maybe can't read it, it says, some people when confronted with a problem think, I know, I'll use regular expressions. And now they have two problems. <laughs> and uh, Jamie Zwinski, or JWZ, uh, very famous, he, uh, his tagline on Mastodon is, um, I wrote your parents' web browser, uh, which isn't true because he wrote my web browser, which means I'm really old. Um, my kids have no idea. They've never heard of Netscape. Um, but he wrote Netscape, or at least a large part of it. Um, although my first web browser was actually a mosaic on the Amiga. And if you're an Amiga person, yeah, Pierce is like, Pierce is like he's, I knew he was going to put an Amiga thing in here. Because yes, I did. There's, there's the Amiga thing. So yay, a mosaic. But if Jamie Zawinski can say regular expressions are problematic, then, then you know, what, are, what are we mere mortals to do, right? What, what hope do we have in this world if, if JWZ thinks they're problematic, right? Well, what you can do, or what we're here to do, is learn about what regular expressions are under the hood, how they work, why they're the way they are, why they can be problematic, why they are a, a preloaded foot gun in some cases, and how we can maybe unload the foot gun or, or work a little bit better with them. This talk is not about how to write regular expressions. Much smarter people than me have written much better guides than I could ever write on how to write regular expressions. This is going to be more about how regular expression engines work under the hood and how you could maybe even write one of your own or understand how the design decisions made in these under the hood machines affect the security posture of your software. Because as security practitioners, sometimes we have to pierce the veil and see how things actually work under the hood. You know, in theory and in practice, there's no difference. In practice, there is. So. Uh, and so what we're going to do as part of this is together we're going to design or at least come up with design criteria for a, an ideal, from an information security perspective, regular expression engine. Um, and we're going to do that together. It's going to be a fun time. Um, and speaking of that togetherness and camaraderie, if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand in the middle of the talk. Don't wait till the end. I don't want anybody to be sitting here thinking, man, that was like the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I really wish I could tell him how stupid that thing was he just said. Tell me, because I want to either sit there in my stupidness and, and admit it, or maybe we can come to some agreement. So with no further ado, what are regular expressions anyway? What is truth? What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets for you Castlevania fans. That was probably a quote before Castlevania, but they said it in Castlevania. Um, well, let's give a very, very brief history of regular expressions. Because I am a history nerd, I have to talk about it just a little bit. So regular expressions were first, the, 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 the thing that became regular expressions, were first described by a person named Stephen Cole Claney back in the 1950s. And he was using them to, uh, as a notation to describe the behavior of um, neural nets. Uh, not, and I think neural nets like frogs. I don't think like neural nets like, you know, artificial neural nets at AI. I mean, this was 1951. Um, and Stephen Cole Claney is, is a luminary in the field. This was back before computer science was a, was a separate discipline. This was back when it was still purely uh, just a you know, branch of mathematics, not even a branch, a twig of mathematics. And he studied under uh, Alonzo Church, of uh, Church Turing thesis fame, Lambda Calculus fame, and studied alongside Alan Turing, who of course needs no introduction. Um, and Stephen Cole Claney, also, if you want to get uh, 
if you want to make friends and just really let everybody know how incredibly smart you are, because everybody loves it when you do that, the asterisk operator in regular expressions mathematically is, defined, is called the, uh, the Kleine closure. So every time you see a star when you're writing a regular expression, be sure to say Kleine closure and everyone will love you. So <laughs> just be sure to do that. Um, so then 1968, and actually a little bit before, Ken Thompson uh, took Kleine's um, notation and used it to describe patterns in strings. And then he put it into the QED text editor, which ran on one of GE's operating systems. I don't remember which. It didn't run on Unix because Unix hadn't been invented yet. And then Thompson, when he invented Unix, co-invented Unix, and wrote ed, the standard text editor, he used this notation to describe strings. And then from there, Unix, it spread everywhere. I've got Unix on my phone. I've got Unix on my computer. Unix everywhere. That thing's probably running Unix everywhere. And so regular expression spread with it. Now, what's, what's actually more fascinating or more interesting, or arguably more important, is that Thompson, the most important thing he did there wasn't putting regular expressions in ed. He actually came up with a really fascinating way of evaluating regular expressions that made them much, much more efficient. Um, they had been studied by other scientists and uh, other mathematicians, but his way, the Thompson construction, was the first way of actually running them truly efficiently. Uh, and, that's, and we're going to touch on that very briefly later. Like, I mean, that's obviously, it could be a whole talk, but it's, it's a really fascinating and beautiful thing and one of the things that I love about regular expressions. Um, and he also, he, uh, the original paper, he actually even describes evaluating regular expressions uh, via a, a sort of a just-in-time compilation thing. He's like, oh, yes, if you have this thing in a regular expression, this actually compiles to this, this sequence of uh, IBM 7094 instructions. And, and he actually gives, and it's, it's really neat. It's, it's, you know, this was back in like 1967. It's amazing. Um, and then in the 1980s, uh, Rob Pike, who y'all might know as, you know, one of the uh, main forces behind the Go programming language and Plan 9 and a lot of other things, um, he came up, he wrote a text editor called SAM. And Sam is the most beautiful text editor you've never used. Uh, and you should read the, tech, the paper, a text, the text editor Sam. It's one of the best papers in all of computer science, in my opinion, and I'm never wrong. And what he did in Sam was he, he made regular expressions very fundamental to the construction of the editor. And um, he came up with, so you know, submatches, right? Uh, when you've got parentheses, parenthesized sub-expressions in a regular expression. It was thought that you couldn't evaluate those efficiently using Thompson's construction. And I'm glossing over a lot of details here. But, and then Rob Pike, when he wrote Sam, he, he solved the problem. And then nobody noticed. It sat for years. Textbooks were published after the Sam text editor that said, yeah, Thompson's construction is great, but if you want to do submatch tracking, there's just, what can you do? There's nothing you can do. And then you know, people noticed the Sam text editor was doing it right and, and whatever, whatever. And, uh, and I will digress very, very, very briefly. I, uh, I actually am a big fan of the Sam text editor, obviously. I updated the original uh, 1992 open source release to get it working on modern uh, Linux, modern 64-bit uh, operating systems, modern font rendering and all that. And I got an email one day that said, uh, it's so nice to use this text editor that I, I always loved using when I was younger and I, it didn't work anymore, so I really liked your work. And I was like, oh, great. And then I noticed it was from Doug McElroy, who invented Unix pipes. And I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> I was like, well. So that was the highlight of my career. It was all downhill from there. It was, it was great. So I'm not, not all downhill. Sorry, Run Zero is great. Sorry, I love you. This is the highlight of my career. It's great. OK. So all right. Um, so before we go too far, I want to make sure we're all, everybody here knows regular expressions, I'm sure, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But I want to just very, very briefly go over the syntax so we're all on the same page. So, and the syntax is not semantics. There are alternate syntaxes, syntheses, but, but let's just, you know. A single character matches itself. Single dot can match any character, except maybe new line, depends on a setting of a flag. Question mark marks the previous expression as optional. Uh, a clan closure. Uh, marks the previous expression as zero or, or infinite, you know, any, any number, zero or more. Uh, a pipe, not the Unix kind, does alternations, can say, you know, one or the other. Parentheses for grouping and capturing. Character classes, which match a single character or, you know, a range. Inverted classes, where you just say anything not named. A plus, which says one or more times, and then counted 
repetition, where you can say at least this many times, but no more than this many times, and there's usually defaults to say zero and infinite and whatever. And then some common zero width syntax. Uh, you've got the caret, which is technically called the left anchor, which is um, kind of like not a great name because not all languages are written from left to right, but it's called the left anchor in POSIX. And uh, it matches the zero width string at the beginning. The dollar sign matches the end, um, which is not trying to say that money is the end all because it really isn't. <laughs> and then you can also have zero width assertions like, you know, I want to match this zero width string that has a, uh, a word character on one side and a non word character on the other, word boundary, things like that. And then you'll notice, and this is when you implement a regular expression engine. There's a lot of redundancy. For such a, a, an arcane syntax, an almost seemingly intentionally arcane syntax, there's a lot of redundancy. Um, you know, a dot can really just be a character class that matches, you know, everything in your character set. An inverted character class is basically the same thing. A plus can really just be a, a star, you know, for example. And then counter repetition can be done with just some creative application of copying the expression and then question marks or stars. And then you get to the back references and look ahead and look around and look behind. What are these? These are not, everybody brace yourselves, these are not regular expressions. Um, these are constructions that are put in a lot of things that call themselves regular expressions, but they actually violate the fundamental principle of what regular expressions are in a, in a mathematical sense. So back references, um, if you're not familiar, back references basically there you can refer to a previously captured piece of the string and say, you know, I want to see that again. And uh, look ahead, you can say, oh, I want to match this letter, but only if it's not followed by this next letter or is followed or whatever, but don't include that as part of the match. And those constructions are great, but they're not regular expressions. They actually require a different kind of formalism. Um, and what they, what they have in common is they, the, the thing that regular expressions need to be truly formally regular expressions is they need to depend only on the current state of matching and the next character. There can be no other context. Um, whereas back references obviously require memory. You have to remember what you saw. And you know, look ahead or look behind or whatever requires you to look at more than just the next character. Um, now for you computational linguists and computer scientists out there, I am intentionally conflating and ignoring the difference between NFAs and DFAs and recognizers and, you know, finite state machines and all that stuff. And so I'm sure monocles will be popping out of eye sockets and teacups will be dropped when I do this, but it's, uh, it is what it is. But to give you an idea of, of kind of what I mean, um, this is a, a finite state machine representing a payphone trying to get 25 cents to get to a dial tone. Um, and for those of you under the age of 40, a payphone is something they have at DEF CON <laughs> that they do for pranks. Um, but it's, you know, but you'll notice that nothing, you, all you need to depend on to get over here to dial tone. You start, you say, oh, I need 25 cents, you know. And well, if you put 5 cents in, well, okay, now I need 20 cents. And then if I put 10 cents in, well, now I need another 10 cents. And then if I get 10 cents, I go to dial tone. But if I get 25, I go to dial tone and so on. You'll see that at no point do you need anything other than where you are now, and what you just got, and that's sufficient to get you to the end. And that's how regular expressions in the, in the formal sense work. Um, again, DFA, NFA, but yes. Um, and that's how regular expressions work. They just they take their current state, and then the next character, or the next input, the next symbol, and move on. And that's a very nice construct because they have no memory. They require very, very, very few resources, just the current state, and really just the current state, which can be encoded as a very small number. And that's why they're so efficient. So as part of this talk, we're going to talk about these common implementations, and then we're going to talk about how they stack up against our, uh, our rubric, which um, I, 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 I never used the word rubric until my kids were in school, and apparently that's like the new hotness, but yeah, rubric. So um, we're going to start. So POSIX style, that's uh, specifically extended uh, regular, POSIX regular expressions. JavaScript, or more accurately ECMAScript, Python with its RE module in the standard library, Go with its regex module in its standard library, Rust doesn't actually have it in the standard library, but the regex crate is so popular it might as well be, and then the odd one out, which is Hyperscan, which is a project from Intel that is designed to be the world's fastest regular expression engine, and it is, which is pretty cool. So 
Let's get to our security concerns and our design goals. So denial of service conditions. Everybody knows about Redos. And if you don't know about Redos, you're about to learn about Redos, so that's great. So as we saw, it's impossible to implement a regular expression engine with uh, back references or look ahead or whatever that doesn't um, require some extra memory or some extra resources. So if you want to have those features in your engine, by definition, you are going to be vulnerable sometimes in some ways with some inputs and some uh, regular expressions to very quickly using up resources, potential resource exhaustion. Um, and to do that, actually, let's, um, and it's important to note that even if your engine, even if you're not using those features, even if your expression doesn't have back references or doesn't use look ahead or whatever, it could still be vulnerable because a lot of times engines aren't going to have like a separate safe engine over here and then whatever. And so let's actually, let's, I've got a little live demo just to show you what I mean. And um, I showed this to uh, my son, uh, my older son, the other day. And he said, oh, yeah, Dad, you got to show that at the talk because it's cool. And I was like, dude, that's why I wrote it. But yes. So it's a little, uh, it's a little program here. We're going to look at Python. Um, by the way, opening Vim, everybody rest, rest in peace, Bram Mulnar. That's, uh, yes. that's God. That's, yes. Everybody, he was very passionate about uh, children in, um, in dangerous situations. And I, it would be nice if, if you have the ability, maybe consider making a donation to one of his charities, because he was a very good person. Anyway, but on a <laughs> slightly down note, so I'm going to run this. This is a little script that generates regular expressions and then generates a string and then matches them. So and this is of order 10. So what does it do? Well, it generates 10, a string of 10 A's, and then it generates a regular expression that is 10 A question marks followed by 10 A's, and then it does the match and it tells you how long it took, right? So everybody, everybody see that? It's not too bad. Is the font big enough? Look at that. It's even bigger. So now we can say, okay, so 10. That took some minuscule amount of time. What about 20? Still faster than the blink of an eye, right? But you'll notice it's, it's actually a lot, a lot slower to a computer. So now let's try 30. And that is not going to finish for about five or six minutes um, on this computer. And that's interesting because this is not a huge expression, right? Like you couldn't say, oh, well, you know, I'm safe. Uh, I limit my expressions to, you know, I, I, when, my, when my users, when untrusted input comes in, my expression's only, you know, a thousand characters long. I can't, well, here you go. If you're, and, you know, this is obviously a bit of a contrived example, but let's look at the Go version here. Here's the Go version using Go's regex module. It does the same thing. Um, go run linear.go 10. And it's going to take a second because Mac OS has to make sure I'm not running malware. Um, so go run linear go 10 and see it does the same thing and it took 413 microseconds. Now let's try 20. Took 238 microseconds. 30 took 259 microseconds. 1,000 took 30 milliseconds, right? 1,000 in the Python version would not have finished before the sun went to red giant phase. So um, it's pretty, and again, this is contrived, right? Like I, but this is a real thing. Um, it, at my job, we have uh, a tool that has a Go implementation and a Ruby implementation, and then it's got a test harness that I think is written in Python. And I wrote a real regular expression that I got paid to write, like for real business purposes, in, you know, ran it in the Go code, it worked fine, kicked off the test harness, which usually took a few minutes, went, got lunch, did whatever, came back, got busy doing something else, closed, you know, shut down for the day, went home, went, up to, went upstairs, came back down, and the test harness was still running the next day because that regular expression kicked into this bug, right? So this isn't something that is, yes, these are contrived, but these are contrived for the purposes of example. I mean, nobody would say, you know, ah, you know, if they were, if they were dying, they would just say it. They wouldn't write the regular expression, right? Um, but uh, yes, the castle of ah, see, I, I, I knew I was going to make that joke, so I, I put that in there. Um, but yeah, <laughs> there are some other denial of service conditions that are much less likely to happen, but are still relevant in a lot of situations. Um, for one, most engines will do memory allocation at matching time. Um, Python, uh, Go will do at least a few allocations to return the match, things like that. Uh, Python has to allocate everything pretty much on the heap. Um, and so you can get excessive memory allocations, fragmentation, um, uh, locking in the memory subsystem, things like that. And um, regular expressions, if they're being used for multiple threads, can maybe result in uh, a lot of lock contention. I know earlier versions of Go's regex module actually had this problem where um, regexes could be shared explicitly across threads, 
uh, without locking, but then there was a lot of internal locking that actually slowed it down, and they fixed that, and it's actually really interesting how they fixed it. Um, you should totally uh, check out the source code at some point. But let's look at, so these are our design principles. These are the first of our design principles for our ideal regular expression engine. We should only use linear time algorithms. We should allocate all memory before match time, and we should use per thread state. So let's see how that stacks up, how our, how our uh, implementations check against our rubric so far. And so far, we've already eliminated half of them, right? These three, it's actually impossible to implement them using these, these requirements. Um, but Go, Rust, Hyperscan, they all do it. And, and Hyperscan gets a little plus because it also does the 100% uh, allocation of memory ahead of time and things like that, which is pretty cool. Um, but then Rust, Go, all that, use guaranteed linear time. But what about streaming matches? Um, and this is something that people, I, this is something that always amazed me is so rare in regular expression implementations. Because, you know, we are trying to analyze network traffic. We're trying to analyze enormous amounts of data. We're trying to analyze things that might be discontiguous in memory. Uh, and we're trying to analyze things on tape. And you think I'm joking, but uh, this is the IBM uh, Diamondback petabyte tape library that came out like last year. So tape is not dead. Um, and there's a funny story about uh, Donald Knuth and the art of computer programming, which he totally is going to finish, just like George R. R. Martin is going to finish um, Game of Thrones. Um, yeah, I know. And, uh, but he talks about tape, and it's, it's interesting. But it is important, because let's say we're doing network traffic matching, OK? And we've got a client, and we've got a signature down here. You know, this is our signature matching this, this totally vulnerable uh, PHP script that has a file disclosure vulnerability, right? So the attacker, who is our client, sends a git, you know, vol and HTTP, name equals Etsy shadow, HTTP 1.0, has to be 1.0 because I didn't send a host header. Um, nobody, really? Oh, that, come on, I was proud of that one. That's funny. Um, get the HTTP 1.0 back, and you get the root, you know, everybody's, you know, file disclosure, it's bad. But what about if we're doing packet at a time? Um, for example, ngrep, which is a very common network grep, uh, that's why it's called ngrep, um, won't apply regular expressions past the packet boundary. So if our attacker just breaks it up, you know, like such that no one packet will match the, uh, the regular expression, it just bypasses detection entirely. And then what about buffered? That's, what, that's by far the more common solution. Um, things like Sorkata, Snort, things like that will buffer, it, although they can be compiled to use hyperscan, which doesn't. But if they don't, they buffer things um, potentially. You can also use DFA with Perl, but that's another problem. Um, they buffer things, and now you've got this memory per stream um, that you don't actually need because you just need to know if this matched or not. So if you can just hand your data to the regular expression engine as it comes by, you can say, oh, okay, I matched or I didn't. Because an attacker could potentially put a whole bunch of extra parameters or do whatever, and now you've blown out your buffer, or um, you, know, you run out of space, or you use excessive resources, or whatever, and you can avoid that if you just support streaming matching. So I say, allow matching of streaming input is our next design criteria. And where do we stack on our rubric there? Well, our rubric, now we've got streaming is supported by Go and Hyperscan, and no one else. And it's really kind of weird. There is an implementation uh, in Rust that I'll talk about later that kind of does it, but yeah. And now, if you're going to do streaming, you also have to do simultaneous matching. Because if you've got the data coming by, you know, it's streaming by or it's discontinuous memory or whatever, you only get one shot, which I think is an Eminem lyric, but I don't actually know. I only know the meme version. And um, so you need to be able to match multiple expressions at the same time. And a lot of engines don't do this. In fact, very few do. So we've got to say, okay, we've got to allow simultaneous matching, right? And who does that? Well, Rust and Hyperscan and no one else. Uh, Google's RE2, which is written in C++, does. It a little bit, yeah. I promise this is not a hyperscan ad. Um, and this is the one, this is the feature that really blows my mind that nobody seems to really implement as much as they should. And this is text and binary matching. Um, most things on the internet are not text files, which makes me sad. Um, I know. And uh, by the way, that's Benjamin Franklin Cat III, and he's a jerk. He got that drawer open by himself, and uh, yeah, um, he was very proud of himself. But there's lots of things that aren't executables, PDFs, GIFs. Not GIFs, because that's not even a word. Um, and, and, sorry. Um, and even with text, actually, there's all sorts of problems, because you know, then you've got to deal with graphemes. Like an emoji is not actually one character most of the time. It's usually multiple characters and all that. But 
But text and binary matching, a lot of engines don't support binary matching, or they, you know, they only support text matching, or they only support Latin one or binary or something like that. And I want to give, again, just sort of a quick example here. And this was an example that came up when I was working on a Modbus TCP thing. But um, what I'm going to do is, so here, here's text binary. So this is using um, Go's, mod, or, uh, Go's regex module. So I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to run the first example. Oh, and let me show you. Yeah, here. So here's the, here's the regex we're matching. These first two bytes, let's, or these first two characters, whatever, let's, uh, notionally, those are a transaction ID or something like that, right? The, the binary protocol says, oh, I've, these first two bytes are a uh, transaction ID, they're variable, whatever, but we don't care about them. We just care about, you know, whatever the op is, the opcode. So we run that regular expression against that, and it works. When the, when the X ID, when the transaction ID is zero, it works. Great. But you're saying, oh, well, that's, yeah, okay, that's null, right? That's not a big deal. You know, let's try something that isn't ASCII. You know, will that work against that? Not something that's not ASCII. Well, let's see. Running against that, we're running against FFFF, and it matched. So obviously we're safe, right? And I've seen this happen. A lot of people, they'll write binary parsers, or they'll write things where they're trying to extract information from things that aren't text, and it just kind of coincidentally works. But this isn't coincidence, right? This is FFFF. It's like the least ASCII thing you can get. It's the, the Y with the umlaut. So, okay, that's, I also was proud of that one too, because I remember that um, in Latin one. So let's try third, just to be sure. It's, you know, it's spaces, yeah, it works fine. But then let's try this. What happens when we do those bytes? Suddenly it didn't match, right? C2A3, those are two bytes, but it didn't match. Why didn't it match? Does anybody, can anybody guess? Just curious what C2A3 might be? C2A3 is the UTF-8 encoding for the British pound sign, pound sterling. And so what Go did was it decoded one character and took it and went on and then skipped over basically to here and now things don't match. And a lot of engines don't support that. It means that a lot of these engines are not really useful for uh, binary file analysis or network traffic analysis or things like that. They're, they're kind of hobbled. Um, so that's our next design principle. So we should support binary and text. And who does that? Well, Python does it actually in the most elegant way possible. Um, Python's really good about it. Uh, Rust and Hyperscan, but not Go. There is a third party module. It, it, calling it third party is kind of funny because it's written by Russ Cox who also wrote the main module, so it's really not. But it's, he wrote a binary regex module for Go. Um, but it's not included in the standard library, so it doesn't count. But JavaScript, POSIX style, you can't do it. And then what about safe compilation? Let's say we're letting our users put regular expressions in. You've got a field on your, your you know, form or whatever. You put a regex in. Well, what if they can just blow up the compilation step, right? What if they can make your compiler that's compiling your regular expression go, go boom? Um, and so obviously, yes, you need to limit the size of the regular expression that, uh, that your attacker, your totally legit user can put in. But even still, relatively short expressions like, like this here, you know, that will blow up some implementations. Uh, deeply nested parentheses, if you use a recursive descent parser, absolutely will blow things up. Um, and this was a real thing. Like there was, I mean, just recently, last year, Go had a CVE because um, the regex module was vulnerable to a uh, crash. You could do a denial of service by giving it a large enough regex. And I, th I mean, it was reasonably large, like bigger than anybody should be accepting, but it was there. Um, and then also safe deserialization. So let's say you're allowed to compile your regular expressions and then save them somewhere and then you accept input. Well, now you've got a problem like Yara where there's a lot of bugs in Yara that blow up um, if you uh, give it a bad compiled regular expression. Um, so you need to also do that. So there's lots of CVEs for Yara. So limit resource usage and compilation, support safe deserialization. How much time do I have? Okay, all right, we're good. Um, so let's, where does that fit? Uh, Go is the only one that is really, really uh, careful about this, which always surprised me. Um, a lot of the other ones you can get out of memory errors, things like that. And then finally, um, for this segment of, section of the talk, I want to talk about portability. Um, you were saying there's a bit of a, a problem here. You're, you're noticing a theme with hyperscan. Well, here's the problem with hyperscan. It is not portable. It does not work on anything but Intel, and Intel bought it to make sure it will never work on anything but Intel. <laughs> which is pretty crazy. It does some amazing stuff with uh, SMID instruction, uh, vector uh, instructions, uh, multiple data instructions. It does amazing stuff, but it only has an Intel port. And this is an ARM Mac. My phone is running on an ARM. Um, well, 
Now it's running on an ARM. Okay, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, sorry, sorry, I had to. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that's portability. So, how do we get regular expressions to do what we need them to do? Then, in this case, what are the algorithms that are involved? So, the earliest regular expression engines, and a lot of regular expression engines still, do just recursive evaluation, right? So, if you recall from not that long ago, you can represent a regular expression as the sort of directed graph, right? And so here we are, we're representing A, B, A, B, and then or A, B, 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 right? And if we want to do it recursively, well, now we've got, okay, we'll start with A. We just pick one of the branches. We start with A, okay? We get our next character. We get B, okay, that's good. We get our next, oh, it's not, no, okay, all right. Well, I'm dead. I got to go back here. So it'll backtrack all the way to the last choice point and then try the other side. And you can go and go and, oh, now it's going to work. Now, oh, I made it. Great. But with this recursive evaluation, you have to keep the whole string in memory at once. You have to be able to go back at any point. And the, the resource usage, the time factor, is how many possible paths there are through the graph, which, I mean, obviously here there's only two, but you could get very, very large numbers very, very quickly. Um, you know, it's a quadratic state space explosion. You know, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. So you can't do... Uh, streaming matches, you have um, problems with stack space usage, things like that. So this was Thompson's insight. And this is, again, just the most brief, you know, discussion of it, right? Like this is, this was a whole paper by, you know, Ken Thompson and all that. But what he realized was when you get to a choice point, oh, why not just take both? And so he had, he would split and he would have two pointers. And he would say, okay, we're going to take both. And we're going to take the next character, and both are still alive. And we're going to take the next character, and nope, oh, nope, that one died. But that's okay. We've still got one still alive, and we take that one, and we go. And it works. And Thompson's insight there was that you're never going to have more pointers, more threads, than you do nodes in the graph. So at worst, you know, this is what, two, four, six, eight. This is, you're never going to have more than eight pointers, eight things. So you're constant, you're, uh, your resource usage, your state space, or uh, the memory needed to store your state, is of constant size. So rather than having it grow exponentially or blow up or do whatever, you just can say, oh, the, I know I will never need more than, in this case, eight pointers, right? Um, and that was, that was his, his beautiful, beautiful insight. Um, and if you have an efficient mechanism of uh, determining which states you've already seen and which states are alive or dead, um, then it becomes as efficient as whatever that data structure is. And there's a... Uh, an amazing, one of the most beautiful papers I've ever read, um, an efficient representation for sparse sets by Preston Briggs and Linda Torkson back in 93. Um, I didn't read it in 93. I read it much more recently, but in 93 it was written. And um, it's really, really beautiful. And what's, what was cool is uh, when they published it, they did not apply it to regular expressions. It had nothing to do with regular expressions. Um, but then uh, I think it was Rob Pike, but it might have been Russ Cox. might have been Ken Tai. I don't know. It was somebody at Bell Labs was like, hey, this is exactly what we need, and it, it worked great. Um, so highly recommend it, super cool, beautiful paper, totally should read it. Then what about text and binary matching? How can we make that work uh, efficiently? So the good news is, if I had asked this question 13 years ago, 10 years ago, whatever, I would say, I don't know, y'all are on your own. But UTF-8 is now the... Uh, the, it's used everywhere. As you can see in this graph, UTF-8, there, there is no other encoding. Um, and thank goodness for that, because it's, wow, wow. Um, and UTF-8, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to digress for one minute. UTF-8 is the most perfectly designed thing I have ever seen in my life. If you look at design constraints and what needs to happen, UTF-8 is amazing. It is, it, you, you couldn't imagine a more perfectly formed thing. It's perfect. Um, and it's also evidence that Plan 9 is the most influential operating system you've never used because um, every time you use the proc file system on Linux, that was invented on Plan 9, UTF-8, Plan 9. Uh, font rendering on X was inspired by Plan 9. It's crazy. But what you can do with Plan 9, so for character encodings, you know, it used to be back in the day, um, you would have code pages, and they would just be, you know, usually 256 bytes. ASCII is a 7-bit seven encoding. Um, and so the 8-bit you know, because we standardize on 8-bit bytes. The 8-bit is like, oh, okay, now you can use the upper half for things that aren't ASCII. You know, lucky you. Who would ever need more than 256 characters, right? China and Japan don't exist, obviously. So they, uh, they, this is how it works. So this, was, this is the uh, ISO 8859-1 Latin 1 
not Latin one, sorry, ISO 8891 uh, code page, and you can see you've got ASCII in the bottom, or ASCII in the lower part, and then you've got all the way down there to the Y with the umlaut. And what would happen is you'd have different code pages for different national character sets. Like here you've got, you know, here's the Greek one, and usually they would have ASCII in the lower half, so they'd be ASCII compatible, and then they'd have their national character sets at the bottom, or the, the top, depending on how you organize it. And then there's uh, 8859, seven is Greek, 8859, um, five is one of the Cyrillic alphabets, I don't remember which one. Um, but yeah, you've got all that. But then what do you do if you need multiple character sets in the same document? Well, you, you don't, you just don't. Um, or you switch to a multi-byte character encoding. Um, and the first one of that was UTF-16, uh, which used two bytes per character, which is all well and good. And then Unicode expanded to now have a million characters. Uh, it originally started out, it was just the basic multilingual plane with 65,000 characters. You could fit it into two bytes and everybody was happy. But then Unicode expanded to 21 bits. And now suddenly UTF-16, you need surrogate by surrogate code points and it's a whole mess. So they switched to UTF-32 which wasted 11 bits, right? Am I doing the math? Yeah, 11 bits. There's the top bit's always gonna be, the top bit's always gonna be zero and most of the bits, so yeah, it's totally, totally wasteful. So we switched to other multi-byte encodings and they have locking shifts and things would go crazy and whatever. And so then UTF-8 came along and everybody was happy. It's ASCII compatible, 100%. It's self-synchronizing, that's the beautiful part. If I just drop you in the middle of a UTF-8 document, you can tell if you're in the middle of a character or not and where the next character starts. It's, it's really, really beautiful and it does it very efficiently. And so what you can do to match uh, UTF-8 encoded text is just write a byte, a binary regular expression engine that matches raw bytes and pre-compile the UTF-8 encoding. Because you don't have to worry, and since it's self-synchronizing, since it's all that, you don't have to worry about where you start or end. And it just works. And this was, uh, this was pioneered by 10th uh, tenth, tenth edition Unix grep, I think, was where they first started this. But this is what Rust's engine does as well under the hood if you're doing uh, text matching in Rust. Um, Go's engine, even though, it was, even though Go's regex engine was written by Bell Labs people, it actually doesn't do that. And I think it has to do with the way they do rune reading. But, um, but yeah, so this is really just an amazing, beautiful thing that you can do. Um, and then safe compilation. This is, uh, this is something I'm very passionate about as well. Um, does anybody know, by the way, what that error message is? What, what causes that? Or what it's even from? It's, it's Commodore 64, color scheme? Okay, that was from Microsoft Basic way back in the day, and it was if you had too many parentheses in a basic expression. So if you have too many parentheses, you can still actually cause problems. Um, but what you can do is there's actually been a, a sort of a, an interesting uh, convergence in verification of uh, programs, you know, with uh, WebAssembly and eBPF and things like that, you can apply those same principles to uh, compiled regular expressions and you know, maybe do a little bit of symbolic execution to make sure they're valid before you load them. And they can be done, that can be done offline. So you can actually take a piece, uh, a piece of binary uh, compiled regular expression and just run a quick tool on it and say, yes, I can formally prove that this, if this is loaded, it will not cause a crash or an infinite loop, which is pretty cool. Um, and so I really like that. Um, and the safety serialization, I think I actually just said that exact same thing. Yes, okay. And then finally, portability. There's not a lot to say here. Write it in a portable language, please. Um, and if you can get it to run on a pet, that's great. Um, so yeah. And we actually, what, what time do I have until? Yeah, five more. I've got five more minutes. Okay, then I'm gonna give, okay, before I jump into the bonus features, are there any questions? Because I don't wanna run out of time before there's questions. Raise your hands, anybody, anybody? Okay, if you have questions on YouTube, email me. Um, my email is on the last slide, I'll show it to you again. Uh, so real quick, some really cool stuff um, that you can do also is there's some prefix extraction and keying that is done and different things. This is a way to rapidly, rapidly speed up regular expression matching. Um, and what they do is you can look to see if the regular expression um, has a fixed prefix, right? If there's a fixed string that's always at the beginning and you can compute and say if there's a set of fixed strings or something, then um, you can use a faster string matching algorithm. Um, Aho Korosik uh, can actually do multiple strings. Rabin Karp is limited to usually one string or at least multiple strings but only of the same size. Um, Rust uses, Yara uses Aho Korosik. Go uses, I think, Boyer Moore. I don't remember who uses Rabin Carp, if anybody, anymore. 
And then there's one called like uh, Teddy that's used by Hyperscan that's amazing. And it was originally also called like Vomit Comet or something. It was weird. Um, and then also, uh, this is the only actual piece of code that, uh, this, is the, this is the only contribution I've made to regular expression engines is shrink sets. Um, and I'll, I'll post a link somewhere. Uh, but that's a way of uh, disabling selective, reg uh, selective regular expressions uh, in a way that you can reset the set in a constant time. And it's really cool. And I will give you a link in a second to all that. So yes, in conclusion, regular expressions are good, actually. They're not bad. They're not scary. And they just have problems under the hood sometimes that you need to be aware of. And what I want you all to get out of this talk is, wow, regular expressions are neat. There's a beautiful amount of theory behind them. There's actually a reason to the madness. There's a reason the way they are. And maybe I would like to read more about how to write a regular expression engine myself. And boy, do I have some resources for you in that case. So this, Implementing Regular Expressions by Russ Cox, it came out in, I want to say like 2008, something like that. It is hands down the best series of articles on regular expressions ever written, ever. It is, the, I, I would not be where I am today if I had not read this article, this series of articles. It is beautiful. Absolutely highly recommended. Very accessible to anybody with any programming background. You don't need to be a mathematician or anything like that. Um, really, really worth it. Highly recommended. Um, and then there's a paper describing hyperscan. That's really, it's very, very cool. Um, efficient submatch addressing for regular expressions by uh, it's a Finnish name, and I apologize because I'm going to butcher it. Vili Lorikori um, describes a really cool way of doing submatches that uh, was discovered independently of Rob Pike's method that's really cool. And then the Ergex regular expression engine is an engine I wrote that did, does a lot of this, not all of it. And it's purely experimental. It's not super fancy, but it does work if you're interested. Um, it's written in Rust. I wrote it like three years ago and then haven't touched it since because I just wanted to make sure I still could. So. There we go. Thank you. There's my email address if you have any questions. All right. Anybody? I finished on time. That's, that's good for me. That's a so, yes, yes. So, all right. Thank you so much, everybody.